Across the world, ceremony and ritual are central to the way in which we engage with death. The Requiem, though originating in the Catholic Church, continues to develop in the hands of composers and other artists, becoming increasingly abstracted, secularised and universally accessible. My name is Helen Ottaway. I'm a composer and sound artist who over the years has repeatedly found herself working alongside other art forms, particularly theatre, dance, performance art and visual art, and collaborating with other artists. These interactions with other disciplines and my two encounters with composer and thinker John Cage have influenced the way I plan, compose and place my music. I rarely think in terms of pure music for the concert hall. I think of my music as site-specific or site-responsive. It's important to me where the sounds and music have come from and what their relationship is to their environment. My mother died a few years ago. I'm a certain age. This is happening to my friends too. We're becoming orphans. We are now the older generation. What happens next? Do I go on just the same? Does this change me as a person or as an artist? Does my new situation even have anything to do with my artistic practice? Well, actually, yes, it seems that it does. My working life experienced a long pause while I looked after my mother in her final years. I don't begrudge it. I valued the time we spent together, even when she was quite ill. When she died in March 2017, I experienced grief and I missed her. But her death also released me back into my working practice. And I was finally able to accept the opportunity, offered twice before, to take part in the Sura Madura International Artist Residency. The residency took place in Sri Lanka, where on Boxing Day in 2004, the people suffered catastrophic losses as a result of the Indian Ocean tsunami. With my recent personal bereavement as well, I decided that my residency would focus on loss, absence and memory. My idea was to start to write a new kind of requiem, a site-specific work combining live choral music and sound installation and outdoor performance. My aim while in Sri Lanka was to create sketches and miniatures, pieces which can stand alone but also be the starting point for the larger work I was planning. I knew there'd be no piano where we were staying and that I would have to find other ways of writing music. Several years ago, I had bought on a whim a musical box mechanism. The kind that plays by winding a strip of punched paper through it. I decided on the basis of its simplicity and its size that this would be my ideal travelling composing machine. And so I packed it, along with my handheld recorder, a couple of hydrophones and some tiny battery powered loudspeakers. I spent my time in Sri Lanka talking to local people and recording their memories of the tsunami, making field recordings of nearby locations and nature, and punching paper strips to make tunes for my musical box. I found the activity of sitting and punching patterns of holes in paper strips gave me time to think and reflect, to absorb my surroundings, and mostly just to be with the sea and the endless and enveloping sound of the waves. It became clear that this little musical box would hardly be heard above the sound of the waves unless it had a soundboard and a box. So I commissioned a long box with soundboard for the mechanism from Nalinda, the woodcarver across the road, and the result was a beautiful mahogany musical box. This is the musical box that I brought back from Sri Lanka. But a couple of months ago, it had to undergo major surgery. The mechanism had started to stutter and stick. So reluctantly, I had to let it go. A while ago, I'd been told by a French musical box manufacturer 
that my original was cheap and basic and might not last. This being the little device that travelled to Sri Lanka with me and played my first pieces, I was very sad to say goodbye. The same Frenchman had supplied me with a superior model, so my partner Steve and I set to fitting the new mechanism. This involved a certain amount of sawing and drilling and making the new part fit, so I'd like to thank Steve for being surgeon. The new musical box is smoother and has much less of the roughness of the original. During this talk, I'll play you the five tunes I wrote in Sri Lanka and tell you a bit about them. I gave them the collective title of Wave Songs. The first one I made, I did at the bottom a kind of wave pattern to reflect the sea. And then over the top, I put fragments of a tune that my mother loved, Blow the Wind Southerly. So this first piece sounds like this. The second of the pieces that I wrote was inspired by fishermen that I saw pulling their nets out of the sea. They were singing a song as they, as they hauled, and although I didn't hear much of it, I heard just enough to base this second wave song on that tune. As you can see, this is quite a visual form. And so for my third piece, I decided that I would try to create waves on the paper strip. So I drew the waves on first and then I punched as many, as much of the line as I could so that you get the pattern of the waves visually. And I think it is slightly, it does slightly sound like waves rising and crashing.
Another piece of work I made during my residency was a performance I called Drawing in the Sand. I was looking for a way of illustrating the transient nature of life and also of sound. At the same time, I wanted to reflect something of the human instinct to, instinct to survive and the drive to keep going in difficult times. This sense of keeping going was especially noticeable on the southwest coast of Sri Lanka, where the people have no real alternative to living on the coast, but who live with the constant fear of another tsunami. My performance consisted of drawing musical staves in the sand with a rake that I had customised, and then with a branch sharpened to a pencil-like point, I attempted to write a tune before the waves washed over and erased it. In the autumn, on that beach, the tide hardly moves and is always very close to the shore, leaving only a short expanse of sand exposed. Once or twice I managed to, to write a whole tune. Once or twice I managed to write a whole line of my tune, but it was never very long before it was washed away. I enjoyed stepping outside my usual practice to perform this durational piece. It seemed like an important thing to do, to introduce new ways of working, particularly this physical performance with the element of endurance. Both the hole punching and the sand drawing were new kinds of activities for me. One of the great gifts of the residency was time. The musical box tunes and the sand drawing are examples of me finding new ways of using time in the production and performance of my work. I found myself surrounded by lines. I was drawing lines in the sand, but also there was the line of the sea, the line of the road, the line of the hotel corridor, the line of the road to the jungle, the line of the, line of the railway tracks. And so this fourth tune, which I call Drawing Lines, is it's a kind of minimalist piece, but based on different lines layering up over each other. I mentioned the sound of the waves earlier. We were staying in Hikadua, in a hotel wedged between the sea and the main southwest coast road from Colombo to Gaul. The sound of the waves was very loud and constant. No gentle lapping, but the full force of the crashing surf. On the other side, the road with its careering buses and tooting tuk-tuks was equally noisy and almost equally constant. Beyond the road, in the jungle, you were surrounded by another rich sound world. Birds squawking, monkeys, monkeys calling, dogs barking, trains hooting, and still more tuk-tuks tooting. The most peaceful place I experienced was the inland lagoon, calm waters gently stirred by the oars of our boat. I wanted to capture the clash of sound worlds that was my constant companion, and so I made a sound installation to be placed in the corridor which linked the sea and the road. This way, the sound installation was partly an enhancement of the real sound. In that first demonstration, I wanted it to be hard to tell what was real and what wasn't. I overlaid the environmental sounds with snatches of interviews with local people and fellow artists, stories of loss and survival, with water and the sea a continuing theme. 
The Sea Soundscape featured the voice of fellow artist Kina Hodges, who talks about being at the beach when she heard that someone very close to her had died. The Opposing Soundscape features extracts from an interview I conducted with the assistant manager of the Tsunami Museum in Peralia. She tells of her flight inland away from the tsunami with her two children. The sound of water pervades both soundscapes. Other sounds, bells, traffic horns and fragments of the music I'd been writing during the residency, drift in and out. I placed my tiny loudspeakers one either end of the corridor, facing each other. The effect was an immersive enhancement of the existing oral environment, a feeling of being submerged in a heightened and narrated version of the sound world of the sea, road and jungle. The piece will never have exactly the same effect as when placed in the original location, with the confusion between reality and artifice but I've been very interested in how it sounded in different situations. At the end of my time in Sri Lanka, I had the opportunity to install the piece as part of the first International Human Rights Festival in Colombo. It was placed in a staircase between two galleries, with one speaker at the bottom and the other at the top. As people walked from one floor to the other, they passed through the uprooted sound world of Hikadua, and were temporarily immersed. Since I've been back in the UK, I've also given demonstrations in offices, houses, barns and galleries. Each location lends the piece a different feel, making it as much about each new place as where I was when I created it. The corridor inspired the final of my five wave songs. So this piece was written for myself and two of my fellow artists to sing in the corridor. And we did sing it, um, but this is the musical box version of the song. Much of my previous work has been created in response to a sense of place, urban and rural landscapes, buildings and bodies of water. Themes of loss and memory have also appeared repeatedly, and strangely, I've only just recently realised that this was the case. For the most part, my references to loss and grief have been remote, second-hand, historical or based in mythology. Art Music's Thin Air, designed with Alistair Goulden for large religious spaces, is a sound sculpture which brings the building and its inhabitants past and present to life through sound. Our sound installation Lacrimé reimagines re the story of Phaeton's sisters lamenting and weeping for their lost brother. The Opera Room memorialised the tradition of summer opera making at Shawford Mill over several decades and the year-long project In the Field was created to mark the centenary of a particular battle in the First World War, where 25 young men from Wadhurst lost their lives in one morning. Even back in the 1990s, working with the group Three or Four Composers, we were making work inspired by the disappearance under the sea of the bells of 55 churches in Dunwich on the Suffolk coast. The work I did in Sri Lanka was the first time I chose to develop musical and performance ideas in response to the life and death of a real person close to me. 
Since my mother died, now more than, more than four years ago, I have lost friends and colleagues too. And so hints of these others are now seeping into the work. A new, much longer piece for Musical Box and Voice, written in 2019, includes reference to an old friend who died the Christmas before. That piece, called Wind and Unwind, was commissioned by Activate Performing Arts and Inside Out Dorset Festival to be performed under the moon in Luke Jerram's Museum of the Moon, which in the summer of 2019 was installed in Sherborne Abbey. I devised a musical box score that was 15 metres in length, combined with a setting for voice of Thomas Hardy's grief and guilt-ridden poem In the Moonlight. As the paper strip played out through the machine, it unrolled down the aisle, reaching nearly from the crossing to the back of the nave. I thought of it as a life unwinding through music and song, or the shadow of a moonbeam reflected across the floor. The same year, I was invited to, de to deliver this talk at the 14th International Conference of the Social Context of Death, Dying and Disposal at Bath University. It was a real gathering of academics and practitioners, all of whom had a different perspective or a different approach to death. I learnt to study and draw a skull. I listened to renowned forensic anthropologist Sue Black talking about her work deciphering the aftermath of the war in Kosovo. One of the most fascinating of the people I met was Karen Krolak, a choreographer from Boston, who, as a result of losing her three closest family members in a road accident, started to assemble the Dictionary of Negative Space. She had noticed that very often, and when you most need them, the words for what you experience sing, while grieving for loved ones simply do not exist. Her dictionary is full of absence. Numbers stand in for words we need but do not have. We have some, widow, orphan, but where are the words for someone who has lost a child or a sibling? Those and hundreds of other words are missing. Numbers representing missing words are cross-referenced with other numbers standing in for more nameless feelings and experiences. Talking to Karen and reading her dictionary led me to realise that I too had been dealing with negative space, making holes in the paper strips to play through the musical box. I was creating absences, notating losses. The sketches, the installation, the performance on the beach, wind and unwind, these are all points on the way to my new kind of requiem. I'm about to embark on the next stage, which involves collaborating with poet Rosie Jackson. My work on this project so far has been unusually solitary. I did have the help and support of fellow artists on the residency in Sri Lanka, but most of what I've done, I've done alone. I am naturally a collaborator, and although this solo period has been illuminating and empowering, I am really looking forward to working with another artist on the next stage. I think of this work as a journey, both in the writing and the eventual performance. The route and the destination are gradually becoming clearer. The process seems quite different from the usual business of writing music, and just like grief, it seems to take its time. This is the seventh time I've given this talk over a period of four years, and it too is growing and changing. As I've described, the death of my mother was a major catalyst for new work. Personal bereavement is, I think, a common trigger for a requiem. I always thought of what I was doing as having a wider, more universal theme too, hence the focus on the impact of the Indian Ocean tsunami. However, in the four years since I first delivered this talk, I feel we are being overwhelmed with other kinds of loss. Environmental loss, loss of species, erosion of human rights and democracy. These losses somehow dwarf our personal losses. I don't really know how to address this in my creative work, but I have faith in the process and hope that when the new kind of requiem is created, and hopefully I'll also think of a new way of describing it, 
it will be relevant and meaningful. I'd like to finish by playing one of my five musical box pieces again, in a different way. It's one of the unforeseen consequences of this way of writing music, punching holes in strips of paper, that you end up with four different ways to perform each piece, forwards, backwards, upside down, and both backwards and upside down at the same time. I always really enjoy the accidental in art. And it's a happy event when something unpredicted appears. So here is the corridor song played backwards and upside down. <laughs> 